This production is brought to you by the World History Encyclopedia and the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, but today... We are Sadly, Nick couldn't be here today. Hello viewers of the study of antiquity in the Middle Ages. You haven't seen me before on this channel, but I am Kelly, and I am here with an important message about Nick, the usual host of this channel. As you may have seen from his post on the community page a few weeks ago, Nick has been in hospital. This is due to an infection in his heart that caused him to become septic. The infection had abscessed his heart and had shredded his aortic and mitral valves. And after multiple open heart surgeries, pneumonia, aggressive treatment to the infection and severe pain, Nick is now intubated and on dialysis for his kidneys, fighting for his life. Hi, this is D.W. Draffen. You may recognize my voice as the narrator of many of Nick's videos. This whole channel, The Study of Antiquity in the Middle Ages, started with just this one guy, his collection of books, and an undying curiosity for the past. Now, 470 videos and 150,000 subscribers later, Nick made his dream come true, and it's many of our dreams as well. He gave us a home. He's interviewed the leading historians of the day and given them a forum to discuss their most interesting ideas. For all the above, thank you, Nick. Get well soon. Nick's passion is his YouTube channel and has been working so hard to continue growing his community. He has recently turned 30, bought a house with his wife Morgan, and they are expecting their second daughter. And so, World History Encyclopedia has set up a GoFundMe campaign to help Nick and his family through this incredibly difficult time. The hospital bill will likely be significant, and a discharge date is not even being discussed at this point. So they have no idea how long his hospital stay will ultimately be. All the while, Nick has no salary and is on unpaid sick leave. Every single cent raised from this fundraiser will go straight to him and his family to help him recover and return to what he loves doing, creating content for you guys. If you would like to donate and help Nick and his family, you can find the link to the GoFundMe campaign down below. Thank you so much for your donations of any size. Every little bit will help Nick and his family. This production is brought to you by Ancient Origins, reconstructing the story of humanity's past, and the YouTube channel, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. The Battle Axe Culture. Piecing together the age of crushed skulls. Written by Alexa Vuchkovich. Narrated by D.W. Draffin. Peering into the development stages of the Neolithic cultures of old Europe has always been a challenging task for archaeologists and scholars. Reaching so far back into time in the hope of piecing together a detailed picture is a task that involves decades of dedicated work. Understanding the enigmatic secrets of the battle axe culture, which thrived in the coastal areas of southern Scandinavia and is considered to be one of the most important and most intriguing Chalcolithic cultures of Europe, can help us better understand the Indo-European migration and the replacement of old European cultures. Slowly spreading northwards and reaching the shores of Scandinavia, this culture brought with it many innovations and new cultural traits that were iconic of the Indo-Europeans. But what was their relationship with the native inhabitants of these regions? And did the battle axe culture define the future of Germanic peoples? Let's try and find out. Ancient Origins of the Battle Axe Culture The Battle Axe Culture is considered an offshoot of the broader Corded Ware Culture. The latter is considered to be one of the most crucial archaeological horizons of Europe. 
It emerged in the very late Neolithic, late Stone Age, flourished in the Copper Age, and declined in the early Bronze Age. One characteristic aspect of the corded ware culture is the great swath of land over which it spread. At its height, it spanned most parts of Central, Northern, and Eastern Europe. In historic and archaeological terms, the corded ware culture is crucial. It emerged as an offshoot of the Yamnya culture, which today is considered to be the source of the Proto-Indo-Europeans and their language. Thus, as the corded ware culture spread eastwards and northwards, it displaced the Proto-Indo-European populations of Europe and brought with it a new language and advanced technology. Through these migrations, a new world was created that would come to reshape the course of history. The Battleaxe culture slowly formed in the southern regions of the Scandinavian peninsula around 2800 BCE. Its origin lies in the corded ware culture. It's easy to visualize how this development might have occurred. After reaching the Baltic, these peoples might have sailed over to Scandinavia, where through partial isolation, they would have developed a culture slightly different to the original corded ware. Initially, battle axe peoples replaced the earlier funnel beaker culture that thrived in North Central Europe for a long time. The funnel beaker culture was marked by its distinctive pottery and animal husbandry, alongside complex religious rituals. Today, it is agreed that it was of Proto-European origin, unlike the migrating battle axe culture. It is almost certain that the assimilation of the funnel beaker culture was a relatively fast process, taking perhaps a century and no more. While mass migrations and gradual genetic displacement certainly played a big role in this process, some scholars, most notably the famous Maria Gimbutas, stated that a political relation between the natives and the intruders contributed to a faster cultural morphosis into the broader battle-axe culture. One key insight into the overpowering spread and influence of the battle-axe culture is their cohabitation with another native culture of Scandinavia, the pitted ware. The latter was a largely peaceful culture of hunter-gatherer societies, flourishing alongside the coast and dependent on maritime resources. It managed to coexist alongside the battle axe culture for roughly three or more centuries before finally being overwhelmed and assimilated. What made the battle axe culture so unique and successful? The battle axe culture has always been a subject of great interest in the world of archaeology and in particular for Swedish scholars who have devoted a lot of research to this period. One of the major contributions in the field was presented in 1933 by the Lund researcher Jan Elof Forsander, whose doctoral dissertation introduced major defining factors on the subject. It was during this period that the distinctive names for the culture appeared, battle axe and boat axe culture. But where do these names come from? The answer can be found in the distinctive shape of the axe heads associated with this culture. To date, over 3,000 axe heads have been discovered in Scandinavia, many of them discovered at burial sites. These axes are by far the most characteristic aspect of this culture and its identifying trait. They are most often made from polished flintstone skillfully worked in a precise, curved shape resembling a boat. 
The axe heads, even though they are made from stone, showcase an immense amount of artisanal skill and are a clear insight into the advanced technologies that this culture brought with it. The axe heads are almost exclusively double-headed, and some examples show a great attention to detail. It is likely that these heads were of a ritual significance and were most certainly a symbol of status within the society. The ritual axe heads that have been found are often worked from black stone, with angular sides and a pronounced lip, together with a rounded, crushing end. The axes were deposited in burials as grave goods and might have had a ritual or funerary significance alongside being a status symbol for the wearer. Such axes were definitely a deadly weapon that gave the battle axe culture an advantage in warfare. Numerous burials from the era display catastrophic, crushing head wounds, giving rise to the name Age of Crushed Skulls. Another aspect for which the battle axe culture is known are its burial customs. Around 250 distinct burials have been discovered to date in Scandinavia all of them sharing identical traits associated with this culture. The deceased were placed in small, single flat graves without the use of barrows. A specific orientation was followed north to south, clearly due to a ritual significance, with male and female burials being different. Women were placed on their right side, while males were on their left side. The deceased was accompanied by numerous grave goods, of which, of course, the most important is a battle axe head. Besides this, there were stone tools like chisels and work axes, amber beads and antler weapons and arrowheads, as well as remains of wildlife. Pottery beakers were also a popular burial good, with many fine documented. Exploring the Age of Crushed Skulls From these burial customs, researchers have been able to discern a significant difference between the Battle Axe people and the Funnel Beaker people. The main reason for this is the fact that the defining feature of the Funnel Beaker culture was megalithism. Up to the time of the arrival of the Indo-Europeans, the Funnel Beaker peoples raised complex megalith structures, tall stones that had a major ritual significance. Many of these were dolmens, passage tombs of raised stones in which collective burials were conducted. This meant that there were many dead in one location, dolmen, complete with numerous grave goods, this pointed to a collective society that largely lived in unison. Where the battle axe culture differs is in their clear emphasis on single, simple burials within individual graves. Once we take into account a clear warlike element such as battle axes, we can deduce that the battle axe culture was much more individualistic perhaps even tribal, in large measure. When it comes to settlements associated with the battle axe culture, things get more complicated. Less than 100 excavated settlements are known today, many of them without substantial quality of preservation. This is due to the fact that most of these remains are located on arable land, with continuous plowing dissipating the remains. Nonetheless, a certain pattern can be identified. Most of these settlements are located inland, in Scandinavia's south, and very few are located on the coast. This tells us that either the coast was inhabited by the peoples of the pitted ware culture, or the battle axe people preferred more fertile lands located inland. Furthermore, most of the battle axe settlements can be denominated as being of a farm community type and are often closely connected to burial places. 
Some examples even show that houses were located around a burial ground. This perhaps indicates a strong culture of ancestral worship, which was universal across Europe at the time. But even so, the battle axe culture enjoyed certain similarities to the cultures it encountered. It, too, was largely based on established agricultural practices and mastered animal husbandry. Multiple archaeological discoveries have confirmed that wheat and similar cereals were grown in small individual plots, and that the settlements tended to move around due to the growing of these crops as well as for the herding of cattle. One aspect that researchers agree on is the clear evidence of trade. It seems that the battle axe culture was not entirely warlike and engaged in trade with peoples to the north where they exchanged the goods resulting from animal husbandry for different material goods. They also mastered the use of horses and ox-drawn carts, as did the peoples of the Funnel Beaker culture. One thing that is crucial for the battle axe culture and the impact it had on the future of Scandinavia is seafaring. The distinguishing characteristics of this culture were quick to spread, and this is apparently due to their skills in sailing. At the time, sea levels were higher, which allowed them to use the waterways and seas as easily navigable routes through which to spread and conduct trade. This developed into a partially maritime culture that boosted their geographical spread around Scandinavia and helped expand their economy through trade. This is further confirmed by the numerous and widespread petroglyphs, rock carvings, dating to this period, which depict ships. The Ancestral Seed of the Germanic Peoples By far the most crucial role of the battle axe culture is the part it played as progenitor of the Germanic peoples. Upon their arrival to Scandinavia in around 2800 BCE, these peoples brought the distinct cultural aspects of the Indo-Europeans with them, as well as the Indo-European language. Upon their absorption of the native cultures and their fusion with them, different cultural aspects were combined. This was a necessary component which helped push Scandinavia into the Nordic Bronze Age. Today, the Nordic Bronze Age is considered to be the ancestral civilizational era of the Germanic peoples. One interesting detail could easily be the missing link between the battle axe culture and the later identity of the Nordic Bronze Age. The battle axe symbol. Its distinct shape and its obvious ritual use could mean that the axe head was a symbol of a deity, much like Thor, whose chief symbol was a hammerhead, or sometimes even an axe head, or the Slavic deity Perun, or even the Finnic god Ukko. Could it be that the axes of the battle axe culture were a symbol of an early form of a thunder god? Several complex genetic studies were carried out on the two remains located at a battle axe burial in order to confirm their identity and learn more about the genetics of the migrating Indo-Europeans. Thanks to these DNA studies, it was deduced that the male of the burial carried the haplogroup R1A. The R1A group is the most common paternal haplogroup of the various corded ware cultures and widely attributed to Mesolithic Eastern hunter-gatherers. The ever-changing fate 
of old Europe. Time is ruthless when history is in question. It's easy to write about the disappearance of one culture and the emergence of another, but for the peoples of that faraway era, things were different. These were processes that took hundreds of years to complete, and weaker, primitive peoples were often faced with disappearance and assimilation, which is never a pleasant thing. But such was the way of life in ancient times, which was characterized by mass migrations of technologically advanced peoples whose innovations and skills often brought an abrupt and dramatic change in the lives of cultures that had developed peacefully for hundreds of years. And so it was that the rapid spread of Indo-Europeans brought an unstoppable change for old Europe. The original Neolithic cultures had to fuse with the invaders, attempt to resist, or disappear altogether. And so the future was forged and cemented one century at a time.